Hi, I'm Shamika and I've been marked. I have experienced a miracle in the life of one of my children. Um, when I was pregnant with her, I was told that the fetus was growing halfway in the sac and halfway out and that I would have to terminate the pregnancy and I most likely would not have any more children. Um, only to find out that four months later after undergoing a medical procedure that she was still there and um, she was perfectly fine. She, there were no medical issues and I actually ended up having more children after her. I realized that Jesus was the answer for my child when I went through that situation. Um, knowing medically that what we went through, she should not have been there and she was and that everything was good. I realized that, you know, God was the one that saved her life and he was the only one that performed that miracle. And that's when I learned to trust him more. Um, the Lord changed me in this process. It sounds a little funny, but I felt special. Um, I felt chosen because he could have chose anyone to carry her, um, but he chose me. And to go through it the way that I went through it, I just felt like there was something about me that he chose, that he saw in me to choose me as her mother. So that made me trust God more and have more faith. I would encourage a parent who needs a miracle for their child, um, I would tell them to have faith. I would tell them that no matter what it seems like in front of you, no matter if it feels like your child's sickness is never going to go away or that their illness is still going to be there or their mental illness, no matter what it is, um, you have to trust God in the, in the process. Um, God is their parent, their ultimate parent, and He has the authority over them. He has just chosen us. So we just have to have the faith and through our faith, they are healed. So we just have to trust God. Study all in itself. That was a Bible study all by itself. And so welcome um, to our seventh session of Marked uh, by Miracles. We are studying the book of Mark um, on this snowy Thursday. And so we are not in our normal places. We are trying to make sure that we are safe, um, but where there is a will, there is a way. And so God um, provides, he allows us to have multiple um, options so that we can get this gospel um, to every corner of the globe, because that is what we are aiming for. And in order to get the gospel to every corner of the globe, we need you to share this video right now. So hit that share button while you're at it. Also hit the like button, hit every button that you can find, mash them except for the angry button. Uh, mash them all at the same time, uh, because we want to let everybody know that we are here and we're not just present, but we are active and that we are ready to receive the word of God. Um, and we are always grateful for our teachers who are with us um, to also break down the word of God. And so we have remotely, virtually, um, Elder Janae and we've got Pastor Adrian, um, are, they're both with us um, and um, we're just ready. We're ready to dig into the word of God. And so I pray that you all are ready to do the same. And so with that said and done, we are going to be in Mark the seventh chapter today. Um, and before I actually read, you can put your finger at Mark 7 verses 25 through 30. If you have a uh, actual paper Bible, you put your finger in the in there um, and hold that real quick. Um, but we're in Mark chapter 7. I want to give you just a little bit of background before we even read the scripture um, about Mark chapter Seven, and so um, as we kind of look at this chapter, we we find that the Pharisees um, up, um, are approaching Jesus yet again. They don't know how to leave Jesus alone, so the Pharisees are approaching Jesus about his disciples and how um, they eat and how the way that they eat goes against the tradition, right? And so um, in all of the ways that they could trap Jesus, now they've gotten to this, that his disciples don't even eat properly, right? And so it goes against um, their tradition. And Jesus does what Jesus does. Jesus tells them that they are caught up in the traditions of men, that they are caught up in the traditions of men. And Jesus begins from that point 
um, to teach about how we truly honor God past unprofitable traditions. He teaches us the truth um, about um, what it really means to honor God from our hearts and not just with these um, routine actions, right? And so the idea um, of tradition is what lays the foundation for Jesus's next encounter that we're going to talk about today, right? And so the next miracle that we're about to see is actually outside of tradition, and it relies solely on faith. I want to read two scriptures before I get just um, Pastor um, Adrian and Elder Janae's perspectives, but Mark 7 and 8 actually says, he says, this is what Jesus says to them. He says, you have let go of the commandments of God. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. And then Colossians 2 and 8 says this, it says, beware lest anyone cheat you through vain, uh, through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And um, we want to make sure that that is the backdrop as we look at this narrative, because what we find is that when Jesus steps on the scene, Jesus actually goes against many of the uh, the worldly and even the religious traditions of the day, he goes against it and presents um, something that is foreign to the people because they were used to serving God from head knowledge. They were used to serving God from the actual actions, but they were missing the heart behind it. And so um, once again, I don't think that much has really changed, unfortunately, that sometimes we can get caught up in our traditions, in our rituals, in our routines, and we miss the heart behind it. Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with tradition itself. There is something wrong with a tradition that trumps what God wants to do, that God's priority must be our priority, even if it goes against whatever our traditional systems are. And so um, I'm going to toss this to our, our teachers tonight and just ask just your perspective about the background of tradition in this text. Um, I think, you know, the Pharisees obviously were very full of tradition and hung up on tradition. Um and I think in that space, we can easily kind of look at them and say, oh my gosh, why would they do that? Or even the generation before us um, and believe that they were traditional um, just because they had an older way of doing things. Um, but I think we also have traditions that we can kind of mm -hmm. get hung up on, um, even if those traditions are, even if they seem free or seem liberating, right? Like, oh my gosh, the spirit always breaks out this way, right? Or this always yes. happens, right? Um, that's a tradition. Anything that you are married to the method of, and, and you you preach about this and about not being married to the method of a miracle. Um, anytime we are married to the method and not the actual uh, move of what's happening, um, we fall into that tradition as well. Um, and so I, I think the key to letting go of tradition is realizing that there is no power in anything that we could do outside of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so doing the same thing day after day, you know, time and time again, um, does not mean he's in it. It And even if he was in it before, it doesn't mean that he's still in it. Um, and tradition tricks us into thinking that Jesus doesn't move. Tradition tricks us into thinking that he is in one spot all of the time, and that's it, right? Um, but when you evolve and you grow, you, you see yourself new sides of him. And so if I'm seeing new sides of him, he can't be the same God that I served that way before, right? There's something new, something higher he's calling me to. Um, and so I think we should look at the traditions that we have in ourselves. Even I always pray in the morning before I go to work. That's my time for prayer, right? Maybe he's trying to bust up your tradition of the way you do things um, because he wants to show you something new. So I think we should be open to the move of God, moving past our tradition, whatever that looks like. Yeah. One of the things that what I really um, liked about what you said um, is I think that you highlighted this um, modern tradition, right, if you will. I think that we so quickly gravitate to what is old when we think about traditions, but we can have a modern tradition that really allows us to um, be to be bound to a past movement, right? We're bound to a past move of God. We're, ba we're bound to a past season in God. We're bound to a past um, season with the people of God, right? And um, I think that if this this season, this time period, this period of time, this last year has taught us anything, really what it has taught us is that God is not concerned about our traditions, right? That he will allow things to really break up 
what we are used to, that what is now common to us in order to awaken us again, to stir us again, and to move us to the thing that he is now doing. And so um, I think that even this Bible study is a testament to that because there are many who would love for us to go back to a former method of how we used to do this, but the former method is not the now move, right? And so this now move is what needs to be embraced as opposed to our own personal traditions, yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, important to remember that there are so many aspects when God actually did give instructions to um, the children of Israel in the Old Testament to start picking up some traditions, but there was a purpose behind it the whole point a lot of times was to memorialize something, mm -hmm. to celebrate something and to bring the focus, put the focus back on him. Um, and I think a lot of times we can get so caught up in tradition and forget the why. And um, pastor, you always mention this, remember your why. And um, what can happen is you can start teaching tradition, looking for other people to apply that tradition and never explain the meaning behind it. So now there's all this action with lack of knowledge. Um, and I, I think that um, here we can see uh, the repercussions of really doing that, because if they remembered the why, then it could also help them receive everything that Christ was saying and understanding that the why can remain the same. And yet your actions and how that's demonstrated that you comprehend that and you accept it can manifest differently. So yeah. you can go from um, remembering your why and showing that from eating or not eating something, and then it can flip and it can just be from loving someone and saying hello. Um, so I, I really um, love how he broke down the whole aspect of um, defilement, but I also um, really think this comes down to how we can choose routine over righteousness and convince mm -hmm. ourselves that routine is righteousness. Um, and whenever you get into that space, similar to what Elder Janae was saying, um, you put yourself in a very, um, unfortunate position where you could actually be holding yourself back and others back for the sake of a portion of your identity. Because I really think that we just hold on to um, traditions because we associate them with our identity, with our culture, oh, good. With our race, you know, with our, um, with our denomination. And it, because it becomes a part of you, when someone says, we don't need that anymore, it's almost like people process it as, I don't need this part of you anymore. And that's not it. We're saying we're showing another part of you. We're showing another part of us together so that we can show another part of him. Um, and as long as you're unwilling to forsake your culture and not just do things for the culture, but do things for Christ, then you're always going to have this conversation and feel some type of way. Can I say something? Yeah, I saw you. <laughs> um, so I recently got into um, quarters because I'm like kind of realizing I have a problem. Anyways, right? Um, not as bad as the people on TV, but I don't want to throw things away. Um, but it's similar to uh, Pastor Adrian kind of sparked this thought in me how people who have that issue, they don't throw things away because they identify so closely with everything. Um, and it becomes cramped because they're not willing to let any of it go. Right. And so I think sometimes we don't even have room for the move of God. We want we say, God, do something new in me. Give me something new. I want to see something fresh. But you're, you're holding on to what was so tightly that there is literally no room for him to pour something new into you. Um, and so we've got to like literally declutter ourselves of some of the things. And this doesn't mean to let everything go, but there is some inventory that we'll have to take and, and ask yourself why you hold so tightly onto this thing and you think it makes you you, right? Because it's not about what makes us us. It's about what makes him him. Um, yeah. So if we're holding on to anything that, that's pointing to us, we've got to let it go and remember that it's all about him. Yeah, if I could just um, just put a, a period on that, I, I would also add to what you're saying um, that another one of the reasons that people hold on to things is because they're afraid that they won't get something else um, to replace what was, you know, um, what they have just let go of. And so I do think that locked in some of these traditions really is the idea of faithlessness, right? It's the idea that God is limited in his ability to give us the more, to give us something new, to give us something fresh. And so um, part of it is really us 
being honest with him um, and letting him know that that I want to trust you for the next move in my life, because um, many times the monuments that we are building to what he has done is because we have a fear that he won't do something again. And so um, I want you to um, remember, even as we move forward in this, um, that God is um, not a one trick pony, um, that whatever he does today, that he can do something even greater than that tomorrow. And so it's OK to let go and trust him for the next move. And so with that said, we're on Mark, the seventh chapter. We're going to read verses 25 through 30. Mark seven verses 20 sorry, 24 um, through uh, 30, all right? And so it says, and from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know yet, and didn't want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in the bed and the demon gone. And that is what we will be dealing with today. Um, it's a it's a lot to unpack, um, but let's let's get with it. I want to read verse twenty four again, um, and then we'll start um, breaking this down now. Right, and says uh, scripture says, and from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden, right? And um, what we find is that um, Jesus was um, mobile, right? Jesus did not stay in one place um, long at all, right? But Jesus was actually reaching um, regions. And prior prior to this, um, the Pharisees, they, they try to debate Jesus on the traditions of men and how the disciples eat and how they behaved, et cetera. But Jesus educates them on their clinging to the traditions of men. And he, from there, removes himself from the Pharisees. He removes himself from the disciples. He removes himself from the crowd and goes to Tyre and Sidon, right? And, and I want to point out that Jesus left because he had a work to do, um, that he did not get comfortable in the place that he was in, that he um, didn't stay in one place too long, but he moved from place to place, understanding that um, that his call was greater than the moment, that his call was greater than the moment. And so um, he didn't stick to, tr to the tradition of, of um, that told him who his audience was, um, but he actually, in this instance, he traveled outside, far outside of his audience. He traveled about 50 miles north to get to this city, right? Um, and, you know, I want you to bring it out of our context. When you're talking about a, a 50 mile distance, right? We're talking about by, um, probably by either boat, by, by um, camel, by horse, That's, that kind of sounds funny, but it's actually accurate, right? Um, this is a long journey. This is not, you know, going around the corner in the car. Um, and so it really points to us um, how connected Jesus was to his mission. Um, it, it points to us that the mission was greater than um, any one particular moment. Um, and it also points to us, the message to us is that the harvest that, that God is sending us to literally might require a change of scenery. It might um, require you to get up from where you are to a place that you have um, never been to before, that you have never dreamed of going before, to a place that is completely outside of your comfort zone, a place that completely is outside of your element. Maybe you might have to learn a new language. Maybe you have to might you might have to learn new customs. And the question that I really uh, want to really pose to you from the top is how how far are you willing to go? Right? How far are you willing to go in order to um, claim the harvest that God has promised for his kingdom. Remember, this is not about us. This is not our harvest. This is, we are harvesters for the kingdom of God. And so the question is, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to travel outside of your space of comfort, outside of what you are used to, 
in order to fulfill what it is that that God has um, spoken over us, because what he is asking you to do just might require you uprooting um uprooting period uprooting and 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 going to a place that you um never really dreamed of but he is yet and still calling you to that place right and so while jesus um knew that there was work to do in tyree and sedan he still remained wise right he gets to tyree and sedan and the bible says that he wanted to remain a hidden figure that is what he desired to do right he didn't bust through into tyree and sedan and let everybody know that he was there right um he knew that at some point in time, he knew that the time for breaking down the wall between the Jew and the Gentile was coming, right? And he knew that it was a future occurrence. So when he gets to Tyree and Sedan, right, it's not about his ego. It's not about um, him being popular. It's about his mission. And sometimes I think that we are sacrificing the mission for our own personal gain, for our own personal um, position and status. And sometimes the Lord will intentionally keep you hidden for a specified time. There is a, a time of release, right? It reminds me of when um, Jesus's first miracle, when he um, turned the water into wine, right? The thing that he said to his mother, he said, my hour has not yet come, right? And um, many of us, we'd be itching to do a miracle. We'd be itching to launch. We'd be itch itching to go into full-time ministry. Whatever your thing is, we sometimes are um, quicker than what God is asking us to do. We are in front of God instead of being in line with God instead of being in step with God. And so um, I want you to consider one, how far you're willing to go, but I'm also, I also want you to consider how much will you pull back? How much are you willing to pull back in and so that God can have his way and so that the perfect timing of God can actually align in a way that allows him to get the glory and not just for you to get the glory. I, um, while you were talking, I started thinking about um, how Cain had his moment, and y'all correct me if I'm naming the wrong C character from the Old Testament, but <laughs> um, how um, he definitely did like some trifling things and um, became a vagabond, right? He was somebody who ended up where like his stamp was, hey, I'm a wanderer. Um, and I think that we, take on that mentality and when we were when we're actually given assignments similar to Jesus where you know, we are on the move or God's calling us to be on the move God's calling us to a different region we act like he's getting ready to treat us like Cain we act like we're we're wanderers or that we don't have a place to call home that we don't have him along with us and not as if there's something that's not bigger. Um, but there's there's just a drastic difference between Cain's mobility and Jesus's mobility. Um, and there was still so much passion and humility that God, that Christ had, despite the fact that he was so intentional with hiding. So I also, it's similar to how you were saying uh, how we should be really strategic with how far we go and how much we pull back. Um, once again, like what is your purpose behind your hiding? Um, yeah. Because he, he definitely, it was very clear. His desire was to not be known. Like it was, but even that, which we'll, you know, continue to talk about a little bit more, there was still um, that came from a righteous place. It wasn't like, oh my God, I just don't like the attention. It's like, no, I know I'm Jesus Christ, but I, because of that, I'm also cognizant of what's to come um, and what my purpose is and sticking to that. So I really think that um, this scripture, we could, if we take it out of context, it could be something that people use as an excuse. But if you're looking at the truth behind it, um, even his his um, choice to hide was not false humility. Um, it was sticking to the mission. You know, Pastor Adrian, I was with you up until the end when you started talking about me. Um, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what is another thing to point out, right, is the fact that even though, and this is not just this instance, um, this is pretty much every time Jesus left a situation, he always left situations because he was done with them and it wasn't from a place of rejection. 
Like mm -hmm. Jesus never started anything because people didn't want to listen to him in the last space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of us are starting wow. things or desiring things because of rejection. Mm -hmm. And it, every time Jesus left, he was like, all righty, I'm done with y'all. Like you didn't want to get with me. That's all right. Because mm -hmm. in, at, in, at the end of the day, Jesus was always open to reconciliation. He was always open to the fact that if these Pharisees want to get it right, come on and get this lesson. But some of us are like, nope, you didn't listen to me then. Don't listen to me anymore, right? And so mm -hmm. we're moving, we're building, we're creating, we're bringing other people into our rejection and we're building ministries and churches and just other things, relationships, marriages, whatever, um, off of rejection. And because the last um, city we were in, last region we were in, I should say, didn't listen to us, um, but we should never be building off of rejection. We should be building off of the fact that I'm okay with the fact that this didn't happen. I'm going to dust my feet off like the word tells me, and I'm going to keep moving, um, but I'm not building anything just because someone won't listen to me. I'm not building anything because my last church didn't affirm, affirm me or they didn't pick me for the worship team, right? I'm building because I'm building in spite of those things, right? I'm not building yeah. because of, I'm building in spite of, and because of my in spite of, he's blessing what I'm building. Mm -hmm. Jill, are you, are you good, Adrian? Mm -hmm. All right, Pastor Adrian. Uh, verse 25. Um, but immediately, I, I'm that, that was a lot. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. I want to read it again. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet, right? Um, Jesus, Jesus was hidden. We just talked about this fact that he had this desire to be hidden, and he was. But still, um, he was found by somebody who actually needed him, right? And the message for us is that our seek is never in vain. That um, our pursuit of Jesus is never it never goes um, without a um, an end goal, without an without him actually meeting the need that we sought him out for, right? Um, and, and sometimes we get weary in that seeking process, um, but the Bible tells us to not be weary in well-doing for in due season, we will reap if we faint not. Matthew um, seven and seven through eight, eight um, says, and, it, and ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, it will be open. I do want to point this out. I want to point out, because I think we get this confused sometimes, that what we are asking for, what we are seeking for, what we are knocking for is him, right? Now, he is the one who then determines how he meets the need. But what I really know that I need is him, right? And so sometimes when um, we, we think that our, our, our ask and our seek and our knock are not being responded to, but it's because we are looking for the thing and not looking for the God of the thing, right? And so I want us to change our perspective so that we um, are hungry for him and every need that we have that he then meets from the space of us desiring him, the one who is actually the miracle worker, right? Don't get so caught up in the miracle that you miss the miracle worker, right? Everybody who sought Jesus for a miracle recognized him first as the one who works miracles, right? He, um, it was about it, it was about the acknowledgement of who he was over over what it was that they actually um, needed, right? And so um, all, all this woman knew of Jesus was that she had heard about him, right? She is not from, she's not of a, of a, of a Jewish background, right? She is, this is, we'll deal with that in a minute, right? But she, she doesn't know much about him. She just heard about him and hearing about him was enough to believe in his power, right? It was enough to believe in his ability. It was enough to believe um, that he had the answer to the problem that she had, right? And so we, we have a responsibility as believers, right, um, to actually speak well of him so that other people have no other choice but to try him, that they have not experienced him, they have not seen him, um, they have not tasted of him, but they heard enough about him to be um, to be persuaded to give him a chance, to be persuaded to give him a try. That is what our responsibility is as believers in this earth. Psalm um, 34 and two says, my soul makes her boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear thereof and be glad, right? And so in other words, that as things begin, as God begins to do things in my life and I begin to testify 
of his goodness, that there are hearers who will believe on him just based on what has come out of my mouth. If we are truthful about it, most of us did not have an encounter with Jesus outside of a person. We did not have an encounter with Jesus outside of a person. Our encounter with Jesus started with a person who had already met Jesus, right? And so um, we've got to understand that our role is important in, um, in bringing in the harvest. And part of that role is to relay the testimony of what he has done to them so that they would know that what he has done for me, that he is able to do for you too, right? The Bible says um, in Proverbs 18 and 32, it says that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat the fruits of it, right? And so we have to make sure that while we are um, speaking so many things in the in the world, and while we're speaking so many things in the earth, that we are speaking the testimony of Jesus. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. I do not believe that that's only for us. I believe that, yes, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. But I also believe that they overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, because our testimonies create, um, they incite, they provoke people to seek him for themselves and then they begin to have a testimony for themselves as well. Um, we frequently talk about uh, the immediate response of Christ in these miracles, but this says that the woman responded immediately from hearing about him. Um, yeah. So there's this, um, there was no hesitation here um, for the sake of the miracle of her child, which I love how it was like, this ain't even about me. My daughter's in the bed, sir. So I, I think it's really um, powerful how the, just the, the posture that she already had before he was there um, and how she kept that. And we'll talk about that, how she kept that momentum when it came to her posture. Um, I also like what you were talking about as far as the, the testimonies and the hearing. I read in the commentary, um, they, were, they were talking about how um, no one actually knows exactly how she heard about him, like what that other story was, what that testimony was. And um, the, the writer mentioned that distress is quick of hearing. And I thought mm. it was really interesting. Mm. Um, just, and I, I thought of so many different images, but I really do think that when you are in that state, it was very thought provoking um, for me that when you are really desperate, it changes your posture a hundred percent. And as a result of that, your posture affects how you hear um, and what you respond to. Um, so I really, really, um, I think I, I just want to kind of encourage people to reflect on their posture while they're in that weight. Because if she was, you know, all right, well, this is just what it is. I'm sick of my daughter. You know, like if if that was the space and then someone came by and just like, no, God just blessed my daughter. She could have really missed it and just like, well, maybe my moment just will never come. But distress is, yeah. is quick of hearing. And that really, really blessed me. That's so good. I have a lot to say. So if you read this in... Um, I believe it's Matthew's account. I could be lying, but in another gospel, it talks about how this woman is, it, it reads it from the point of view that Jesus is entering into the region and she's coming out of the region. And so they are literally passing and that's when they have this moment. Um, but what's really interesting is the fact that if that is true, she heard about Jesus even before he stepped onto the scene. So somebody was already talking about him in her city. And so she was likely going to meet him. Um, and so going back to that hide and seek point, she was li literally seeking him. Um, and when she came in contact with him, she knew who it was. Um, and so just this idea of creating a buzz about Jesus that when people get to that point, they're like, wow, I've already heard about you. I was coming to see you because people were talking about you. Like people were talking about your power. People were talking about your goodness. People were talking about your love. And it literally made me seek you. Um, so I think we have to 
I think we remember how much influence. Sorry, I'm doing, moving my fingers too much. I think we remember how much influence <laughs> we have, um, like on social media and like with our friends and in our group chats. But we don't remember how much influence we have on the unbeliever or even the believer whose faith is shaky, um, because those conversations and those um, stirrings, those encouragements, really can point people back to Jesus. Those could be the the make or break moments of whether or not they'll trust him again. Um, and so God has to trust us to be able to speak something well of him so that when they meet him, they know there's nobody else that I'm looking for. There's nothing else that I'm seeking. This is what I've been hearing about. And this is what I need. Good stuff. That's that's strong. That's strong. Y'all y'all touched on a, um, a couple of times on this idea of posture. Um, and um, I, I want to point out, right, that bef before um, before she asked for anything, this woman, the very first thing that she does is that she falls at Jesus's feet. She falls directly um, at his feet. And I need you to think, right? I want you to set the stage again. I want I want you, because sometimes I think when we read, we read outside of the context that it happened in, right? And so we're talking about, you know, desert lands, right? We're talking about in order to fall on the ground, right? Like she is literally in dirt. She is in dust. Um, and, and she chooses when she meets Jesus for the very first time, she chooses to fall at Jesus's feet, right? Like her, her physical posture is indicative of her heart's posture, right? Like she, she did not, um, refuse to humble herself. She did not refuse. I actually would not say, if I can say this, I would not actually call, um, call it worship. I wouldn't call it worship because you can only worship what you know. That's a lesson for a whole nother day. You can only worship who you know. You cannot worship um, what you do not know and what you have not experienced yet. So it wasn't worship. It's easy for us to jump to worship. It wasn't that, but it was humility. It was humility and it was desperation. And I believe that God works through the posture of those who are humble, those who are desperate, those who are um, who recognize um, that they are at the brink of a breakthrough, that that they are recognizing that their moment is here, that their moment has come, and they will not let anything stand um, in the way or become greater than the moment that they are about to experience right now. And in many ways, um, that is exemplified not only by what's happening in our heart, that is what's most important, but sometimes it also, the heart posture actually begins to manifest physically. And so I think it does go both ways that our physical posture is indicative of our heart's posture. And sometimes our heart posture is what changes our physical posture. Y'all good? Sorry, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if you had to go. Um, I was just gonna say, I think this reminds me of you know when people come to the church, come to church for the first time and they have these like really like charismatic um encounters with God, and it's almost like they don't know what to do. Like you see them like 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 moving a lot or like bowing or doing like a lot of um like physical movements. Um, and it literally is like their posture is changing, their heart is changing. And you can literally see that being acted out. And to us, it's like, oh my gosh, what are they about to do? But literally God is working on them in a way that their body is lining up with their heart. And I think that type of humility, it almost, I'm, I don't want to say that it almost comes from those who don't believe, but the, the zeal that you have for God, when you first meet him, that like beginning, like love for him, um, a lot of, people who are converting, they have that love, they have that energy. And I think that that really moves the heart of God that even if, sorry, I'm stirring you, um, even, in, mm -hmm. and it goes from almost like what you said, it goes from just reverence, right, to worship, because in that moment, I'm literally getting to know you. And so it doesn't take me forever to move from reverence to worship. It doesn't take me forever to move into relationship. I'm coming literally into a relationship in that moment. Um, and so I think for those people who are, you know, doubting if, if believers are really having this experience with God, it really is an experience with him. Like literally in those moments, they are coming into right alignment with him and into relationship with him in that moment and it's happening literally in the blink of the eye and that's what the harvest is going to be doing coming off of the street not knowing him and straight right into relationship with him um and it's real and it's true and it's something that god really does want to see 
And to forsake the moment is to forsake the revelation, right? Because it's in the moment, it's the yielding to what is happening right now, that revelation of who he is comes. And if you reject the revelation, you also reject relationship, right? Because relationship only comes through what is revealed, right? It is it is even in, you know, one on human connections, right? It is as things are revealed over time, as personality is revealed over time, it develops into relationship. And so when we are missing these um, humbling worship moments with God, when we're saying that's too much, when we're saying I'm not willing to get low, when we're saying it don't take all of that, what we are also doing is canceling revelation, which also begins to restrict relationship. So I have an odd sleeping pattern. Um, I know that seems random, but please go with me. Um, so I am definitely one of those individuals where I change my position several times throughout the night before I can actually get to the point where I'm comfortable enough where I feel like I can actually go to sleep. And I think that this is a very common position, actually. A lot of people go to sleep like this. But um, I, I think that um, we have to be free enough to explore in that same way where my mission, the goal is for me to eventually actually go to sleep. But I have to be willing to explore different positions and different postures in order <laughs> to get to that space. Um, and I will literally do that all night if that means that I will get one, two hours of sleep because I'm committed to actually reaching that goal. And we can do that same thing when it comes to worship. I think we get so caught up in other people's revelation um, about him and then the little bit of all the knowledge that they have. And we go mm -hmm. into worship feeling like I don't know enough about him in order to do that on my own. But from what we're even talking about tonight, that, you know, there's a challenge there where she started off doing this based off of someone else's revelation. Mm -hmm. um, and from their revelation, she got to experience her own. Um, so she, it did eventually get to a space where she could worship him, right? But it still was not from a space of somebody else's revelation. And I think a lot of us in church are falling down based off of someone else's revelation and thinking that it's worship. Um, so just kind of checking that fit, like you were saying, that physical posture, but also um, whose revelation are, are you actually bowing down on? Well, all right. <laughs> it's going to be that kind of night. All right. Well, let's keep going. Verse 26. Verse 26 says, now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, right? And so we want to deal with um, gender and genealogy because um, that matters in the context of this passage. Actually, ma it actually matters greatly in the context of um, of, of this passage. And I want to just point this out, right? Like the the Bible does not um, put any word um, in the passage arbitrarily right? Like if it's there, it has meaning, right? We don't always get it, but it has a meaning there. So the fact that in all the unknown and unnamed people of the Bible, the fact that it took the time to specify that she was both a woman and that she was a Gentile, that she was a Syrophoenician, all of these things actually matter, right? And so the woman, let's deal with that. <clears throat> the woman Women, I want you to remember the context. Women were separated from men um, in, in private, public, and religious life. So this woman wasn't even supposed to be interacting with Jesus just solely based on her gender. Before we get to anything else, she is actually out of order. Now, I want to remind you of where we're just coming from. We're just coming from the Pharisees telling Jesus about the disciples and that they're out of order for not washing their hands, right? They are out of order, right? Um, which is nasty, but whatever, right? So so they, they are out of order already, right? And so we've just gone from that. Jesus corrects them. He We get to this passage where he meets this woman who was falling down 
at his feet, right? Now here's 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 the thing, right? This woman probably was either married or widowed, right? Adds a whole nother dimension to this, right? She has no right to be laying at the feet of Jesus in the dirt, right? Everything, I'm pointing this out because everything is stacked up against this woman. There, she has no right to be where she is. And not only does she not have a right, she is sacrificing greatly. She is sacrificing her reputation. She could in this day, actually have a, um, be sacrificing some actual physical punishment as a result of her posture, but she is forsaking it all because her need is great and she has found the one who was able to meet the need. And so she goes beyond herself and sacrifices it all for the one who can help, right? And so we dealt with the fact that she's a woman, but let's add some layers to this. We add to the um, to all of this that she is a Gentile who was a Syrophoenician by birth, right? And a Gentile is one belonging to any nation or people group other than Jewish people, right? And so she has she should have no affiliations, even one because she's a woman. But two, let's add to it that she is also a Gentile, right? Now, a Syrophoenician is um, is likely of a Canaanite descent um, and is a native of the Phoenician coast, which is basically um, those who were um, um, entrenched in Greek religion, right? And, and also probably speech. So she is a Greek speaking woman who is bowing down at the feet of Jesus um, without a man present. We've got a problem on our hands according to the custom of the day, but she, again, goes beyond all customs. And the question that, that I really have for you is what are you willing to do in order to access your miracle? What rules are you willing to break in order to, um, to access your miracle? And I want to say this, some of the rules that we're breaking are not the traditions of men. They're our own traditions, right? They're our own personal um, stances that we've made for ourselves. It's the things that we told ourselves that we would never do. It's the it's the pride that we've built up in our image, right? That might have to be torn down. Some of the things that, that we um, might have to get rid of are not the things that other people have put there. It are, it, there are the things that we have placed ourselves in, um, things that we have built up for ourselves, philosophies, ideologies that we have built up for ourselves. And Jesus is asking that we tear all of that down so that we really can see the fullness of who he is and that you can get a revelation of who he is and walk into a greater level of relationship with him. All of these factors disqualified this woman to even speak to Jesus, but she went against the factors and tapped into the space of faith. And so the question that you've got to ask yourself is what factors is the Lord calling you to that is um, going to cause you to move beyond yourself to the place where he is, right? This woman was not too proud to beg. She literally is begging at the feet of Jesus because desperation cancels out pride. Desperation cancels out pride. What will you do for your miracle. You cannot allow pride to be the thing that separates you from the miracle that God wants to do in your life. Um, she was willing to be a risk taker. And I think uh, we, religion, when you worship religion and not Christ, you eliminate that risk taking. Yeah. Um, you then put yourself in a box and you put other people in a box. Um, and for us, I think there's this, this challenge of how many risks are you willing to take and what risk are you willing to take? And we, I've been asking myself this question since God made grass, right? But I realized that my struggle in identifying the risk is that I was Basing, I was defining what a risk is based off of other people's experiences, not what would be a risk for me, but what would be a risk in general. Um, and what's a risk for me may not necessarily be a risk for somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. And what's a risk for me actually just may be based off of what I was born into. And I, I think we are even limiting, we're putting ourselves in a box um, by, um, 
looking at what we were born into and just saying, this is who I am. And as a result of that, these are the consequences. These are, this is the life that I'm going to live, um, good or bad. But she understood that she was a woman. I'm pretty sure that was very clear. She was very cool. She was very um, clear about her race, but um, she didn't allow that to put her in a box. And I think if we're not careful um, as believers, we can leave our implicit bias unchecked, um, which can cause us to have people walk in the door, fall at the feet of Jesus, and we look at them sideways because of what they were born into, rather than seeing that they're getting ready to be, or that they have been born into something new. Um, so she's challenging us not to get so caught up into what we were born into naturally and see the beyond as far as who we can be once we're born again in Christ. Yeah. I once again have a lot to say. Um, so just going back to the whole woman thing, if you've ever heard my teaching, you know, this is a very big thing for me. Um, I just love how Jesus always, always included women in what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that women played very large roles in his ministry, um, and he never forsook that. Um, and I think that just goes back to the whole conversation we were having about tradition, how that was a very large way that Jesus rallied against tradition um, and spoke to women in public and let adulterous women go free. And when he was born, the first woman, to the first person to talk about him was a woman. It was Anna. It's like a one whole Bible verse about her. Um, but Jesus included women in what he was doing. Um, and just the idea of genealogy, I think to make it a little bit more practical for us, I think that a lot of the times we believe that we can't help our circumstance because of what we were born into. Um, mm -hmm. And I, this is what's in my family. And this is, you know, I, I was born with this depression. I was, I, this is, this is a part of me. This is what I have. Um, but this story tells us that regardless of what you are okay. born into and what you are dealing with that may be in your bloodline, the blood cancels all of that. Um, and so regardless of, of what we are attaching our identity to and attaching our beliefs and our actions and our thoughts and our patterns, whatever we are using those to, to ascribe and whatever labels we are putting on ourselves, Jesus is Lord of it all. And he's yes. saying, you can come to me with that because I'm going to do away with that. It, he Jesus like he never said to her don't talk to me because of because of your bloodline no he worked a miracle in spite of it um and if we are if we become more afraid of being stuck than we are of whatever we think is going to happen if we approach him if we become more afraid of the present reality than the than the goodness that is waiting for us then we will really receive breakthrough um we like you said it all and it's all got to come down to pride and this idea of letting it go and not thinking that jesus is going to steal our pride from us he will work with us to help to eliminate pride and, and to maintain that freedom from pride but we have to be intentional about forsaking pride and every prideful opportunity that comes to us, we have to be intentional about forsaking it um, so that we can really experience um, the true freedom that comes with knowing him. Yeah, I wanted to say something really quickly about um, this idea of genealogy um, um, really being stifling us. Um, I want to read this scripture that's in... Um, uh, sorry, I'm looking for it. It's in... It's important enough for me to do this. Um, um, Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse 20. It says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. I want to say it again. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. It was really important for me um, to read that because I hear even in modern um, Christianity, people um, really wrestling with this idea of generational curses. And so this is in the Old Testament. 
where um, where Ezekiel says that that's not the way this thing is going to work, right? The son is not going to suffer because of the father and the father is not going to suffer for the son, but we all have our own walk, right? And so the idea of this generational bondage being the thing that is um, keeping us stuck, that is keeping us bound, cancel that out, right? The blood of Jesus cancels it all, right? What, it doesn't matter what you were born into. We were born again out of it, right? It doesn't mean, matter what you were born into. We were born again out of it. And so um, so it's time for us to really start to really embrace that Jesus really brought me into a new bloodline, that he brought me into a, into a new lineage, into a new genealogy, right? He is a he is in my DNA. He is my DNA. And so um, I really want us to get that because I believe that there are people that are living according to what you have believed about your family life, right? And not really realizing that the freedom in Christ has enabled you to not live according to what you were born into, right? And so my father being an alcoholic has nothing to do with my current situation, right? Like I have the blood of Jesus running through my veins, right? I have I have his blood covering me. And as a result, I can walk right out of anything that tried to walk on top of me. And so I want you all to recognize that you have a new bloodline. Once you are born again, you are born out of all of those things that once cursed you. Um, if I can just add something, I watched a really weird YouTube link the other day um, where there was um, there was a young woman that shared a story that she actually had a rare disease where she was actually her own twin. So she was she actually she had her DNA and her other her siblings DNA within her, and as a result, it weakened her immune system. So this happened like of course um, within her mother's womb and all this other stuff. Um, but I said all that to say is that I think we we try so hard to explain our struggles um, and it's much easier to identify our struggles or affiliate our struggles with our DNA or our our family history. Um, and we focus so much on that that we miss out on the freedom that's available. And we try to live a life with two DNAs as if Christ, we have try to have Christ and we try to have all of those other things. Um, but in Christ, like you were saying, there's this new bloodline. So you don't have to worry about fighting, um, constantly fighting against what was and what they dealt with and who Christ is. And I think we try to, we live each and every day putting an extra burden on ourselves where we feel like we, um, our, our immune system has to be weakened because we have to fight who we were. Um, and who more importantly, who they were, we feel like we have to fight yeah. who they were as if Christ didn't already deal with both of us, you know? Um, so I just kind of want to liberate someone in, in just clarifying if you have his DNA, you have his DNA and stop fighting over something that he's already overcome. Yeah. And I'm going to just do what I feel led to do. I want to pray into that right now. Um, we've been believing God for miracles. Um, and I believe that even right now that the receiving of the fullness of this word is a miracle. It's a breakthrough moment for somebody who's on here right now. And so um, I want you, if you are, if that is you, um, I want you to receive this prayer over your life. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus that um, that everything that we were told that we've been living up to falsely, we thank you that it's been canceled by the blood of Jesus, that your blood is perfect, that your blood, oh God, um, has no, um, um, no, no impediment in it. Oh God, we thank you that your blood lacks nothing. And we thank you that we were brought into your family, that we share your DNA, that we, we thank you that you, that you um, um, have purged us, that you have cleansed us, that you have cleaned us, oh God, from everything in our past, from everything in our present, and from everything in our future. So Father, we thank you that we don't live according to who was, oh God, in our bloodline, but we thank you for who is in our bloodline. We thank you, oh God, for your saving grace, and we thank you that when you do a work, you do it completely. And 
said, Father, right now I declare, oh God, that old things have passed away and all things have become new according to your word. Father, let's change our language. Give us the boldness to change our language today. Not another day will we blame ancestral um, heritage. Not another day will we, will we blame our parents for what we are experiencing today. But Father, we thank you for new life in you. Father, we thank you for new life in you. Father, we thank you for new life in you. Father, I ask, Lord God, that somebody receive the fullness of new life in you right now. If any man be in Christ, he is a new new creature. So Father, we thank you for making us all over again. And Father, we thank you that you have we have brand new mercies every single day that we wake up. So when we wake up tomorrow, God, you gave us a clean bloodline all over again, oh God, that you give us a fresh um, 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 a stream, oh God, every time that we wake up in the morning. Father, let your people receive your word. God, Father, let your people hear your heart. Father, let your people hear your word. Let them be set free from today. Let them be set free from today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Today and forever. Today and forever. All right. We're not done. I just needed to do that um, right now. If you listen, real quick, um, we talked about testimonies. If that is you, if you were struggling with that, um, and you receive the word of the Lord over your life. We just want you to put something quickly um, in 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 the um, in the chat to let to testify that that he did it right that he did it. Just in fact, you can actually even say that if that was you, just just testify that he did it. He did it. He did it. All right, <clears throat> we're good. Y'all good? All right. All right. Verse twenty-seven. We're on verse twenty-seven. Um, he okay. Verse 27, and he said to her, let the children be fed first. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, right? We just talked about all that this woman has sacrificed in order to lay herself physically at the feet of of Jesus. She is a woman. She is a Syrophoenician. She is a Gentile. She has gone against everything in order to be here at this moment. Jesus looks at her. He says, let the children be fed first. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, right? Um, and when he does that, right, Jesus is really, he is addressing this woman's background, but he doesn't address her background in a way that we um, would think is pleasant, right? He he actually refers to her as a dog. He refers to this woman as a dog. And now in that day, um, Jews often um, called Gentiles dogs in a very derogatory way. Um, but to the Greek, to the Greek, um, the word dog meant a shameless and audacious woman, right? To the Greek, the word dog meant a shameless and audacious woman. And so when Jesus addresses her as a dog, Jesus is actually addressing her according to who, according to her culture. He is addressing her according and speaking the language that she understands, the language that she knows. And he is talking about how bold she is. He is talking about how shameless she is. He is talking about how audacious this woman is right, and so Jesus, Jesus seems to he is. It is seemingly, if you read this incorrectly, it seems like Jesus is discouraging this woman by reminding her that the children, the Jewish people, get priority over the dogs, which are the Gentiles like her. Um, but he is not really um, discouraging her as much as he is. Um, 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 Paint, he is he is setting her up is what he really is doing right he is he is setting her up to go up um outside of tradition outside of feeling outside of emotion um and to testify in faith of what she believes that he is able to do for her while miracles are absolutely wonderful they are not glamorous experiences i want to say that again miracles are wonderful but they are not glamorous experiences sometimes it takes a moment of humiliation sometimes it takes what seems to be a moment of shame uh it takes uh the the breakdown of self in order to get what you need 
Jesus never intentionally just humiliates without reason. He's, that's not what Jesus does. That would be cruel. But he wants self out of the way so that he can get in the way. He wants to move self out of the way so that he can get in the way. Because at the uh, once you remove the pride, once you remove the ego, once you remove shame, once you remove all that, the only thing that's left is my faith. The only thing that's left is my trust. That's the only thing that is left. And so he is moving all of that out of the way to set the stage for what is about to happen next. This is my favorite part of the whole story. Um, because Jesus takes what is usually degrading, probably what she's already heard about herself, and makes it a point of celebration. And I think that we are, we can get caught up in what people have called us, right? In the past, in our past life, some of it was true, right? But Jesus is making that a point of celebration for you. What used to shame you, he is now removing the shame from it and making us shameless in it. Um, and he's not glorifying whatever terrible action it was, right? But he's saying, I see what you've been called. I see what you were in. But now that you're in this place, that has a whole different meaning. Um, Jesus can take the sting away from our past. He can take the shame away from whatever was associated with it. And he can make that the platform um, in the way that he works the miracle for us. And sometimes for us, there is a miracle in receiving and letting go of that shame. There's a miracle in realizing that Jesus is calling me higher despite what I have been. Um, and that takes us, like, like you said, um, getting yourself out of the way and getting him in the way and understanding that He's taking me to this place so that people can see, yes, this was me. This is what I did. This is who I was or whatever. Um, but the miracle is that he pressed past that to bring me to something different. Um, and I think we often celebrate our past self as whoever we used to be, right, in the world or before Christ, right? Some of us really, really enjoyed that time. Um, but Jesus is he can use that as a setting stage, but he also eventually wants you to exalt him before that, before your former self. Um, and so he's giving us the opportunity to let go of that identity, but he's also removing the shame from it. So it's not just, oh my yeah. gosh, I'm kicking it away and I'm never gonna talk about it again. No, I was that, but look at what he did to me. Look at what he did for me. Um, and I received the miracle of the fact that I, there's no shame associated to who I used to be. Yeah, um, I'm overwhelmed. Um but I think it's just amazing that God knows the language to use specifically for you, specifically for you. And even though can, this, um, this is also covered in Matthew and when it's covered in, in Matthew and the disciples are like, just don't go away. Why are you talking to that fool? Um, this was still something that they could get a little bit from um, but at the same time, it was so structured in a time of humiliation to empower her. Like that is bananas to me that just from my, my sacrifice of going after you, chasing after you, seeking after you and falling on my knees, knowing that everyone's going to look around and think that I'm a fool. And in the midst of that, you say exactly what I need is, I just, I just really want people to understand that the Lord knows exactly what to say to you. Um, he, he has like these special codes, these special messages that this could have, this almost was like a start of intimacy. This was an intimate moment for them in public. Um, and I just hope that people say, see that the, the, the same way that she went um, her extent, um, her distance um, to be able to meet him, he went a distance as well. He still met her there. Yeah. Um, this, this, what if this whole time, yeah. going 50 miles, was for this woman to be heard that I'm a dog and it blessed her and encouraged her and realized my miracle is coming right now. Um, so, yeah, I just, I think. She, she, for the first time, um, the first thing that he actually said to her, and this is after silence as well, she was begging, but 
he was not responding at first. The first thing that he says to her is a love language that she can understand. And for all of us who have been in that space where we felt misunderstood and we felt like no one was giving us something that we actually need, God always has a way of speaking your love language mm -hmm. and teaching you his at the same time. Jesus. Sorry, can I say one more thing? Um, I just, after you said that, Pastor Adrian, that really like made me think about what if, if she would have got insulted um, or like upset about this and didn't understand that it was his love language. Um, I think that we can, almost like with a parent, right? You can get so caught up with the harshness that you miss the love, mm -hmm. but there was so yeah. much love in this. Um, and if you're listening um, with the wrong ears, like uh, Pastor mentioned earlier, if you're listening with the wrong ears, you hear the wrong thing. Um, and so I think that our scope of God will change if we change our ear and listen for love. Oftentimes, the reason why we are offended is because we're looking for offense. Man. But if you look for love, you will hear love. Um, and even when you just said that, that like changed my whole outlook on this whole thing, which is really ironic. Um, but like the fact that this was really, there was so much love in this. Um, and you, if you're not listening for it, you won't hear it, but we should be li literally listening for the father's love in all situations. Can I, I'm sorry. Can I just yeah. add one more yeah. thing? Yeah. I also just want to remind people that God's love doesn't stop for, for you in spite of other people's response to you. Like clearly the, these disciples were not really a fan of her, but that did not block, shorten, um, disable, turn off, like his love doesn't have a switch, um, is who he is. So even when you're in spaces and in environments where it seems like, oh, well, I want my miracle, but there's these other people that don't want me to get it, that those people won't stop his love from manifesting and coming to you and having you get the miracle that you need. And the miracle doesn't just come in your household being free. Um, when you get back, the miracle actually started here because she was able, in, in spite of who she was that we talked about, she was able to experience um, his love in the presence of her enemies. Yeah, good stuff. Verse 28 said, but she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumb. I want to read it one more time. But she answered, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. I want to just say this, like even when I just read, yes, Lord, just now, like it just, it felt different to me, right? Because usually when we give God a yes, it's usually to something that we we really want right it's like give him a yes it's something that we want something that we're gonna you know that that um that it, it, on the surface it just see it's pleasant it looks pleasant it looks great it's packaged nice give god a yes right um but this was a yes to the fact that i am a dog right like this is a response to what many people would have thought to be an insult remember right People, other people are are present, right? So not everybody there understood this language. There are some that heard dog as dog, right? There are some that heard it, right, in a different ear, right? And in the midst of that, she chose a yes, Lord, instead of trying to um, convince the people that she wasn't what she, what they were saying that she was, what he said that she was, right? The response to what was an insult. Um, in some eyes was simply a yes. There was no offense. There was just pursuit. There was no um, defense. There was just a yes, Lord. But even, even still, even the dogs, right, under the table eat the children's crumbs, right? Like the, the offense would have blocked, blocked the miracle. The offense would have actually blocked out the miracle. And I believe that many times we are asking God for things, but he is saying, like, you have to remove the offense first, right? Remove the offense first. This is the thing that um, that that keeps us from um, in unforgiveness, right? Um, being offended, right? It, it allows us to be um, to be locked into guilt. It locks, locks us into shame. Like offense has 
um, is a root that has branches, right? It branches off into um, other things. And so many of us really, uh, before we really get to this place of give me the miracle, I think that there also is an introspection that says, God, is there anything in me, um, any roots in me that need to be pulled up that will be causing me to not be able to um, um, receive all that it is that you have for me, right? And so she says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, right? This woman now, she goes from being called a dog to calling herself a dog, right? Like she she, she owns what it is that Jesus has spoken about her. And what's crazy is, right, we, off, we always, we say like, hey, you know, um, um, what is it that the Lord says about you, right? Like you call yourself according to what he has called you. But in this instance, right? Like, are you, do you agree with what the Lord is calling you, right? Because he is really um, putting her in a, in a position to actually humble herself. This is not the moment where he calls you up higher. This is the moment where it really is a humbling moment for this woman to be able to hear what she just heard because really even outside of the comment of her being a dog there's also a almost seemingly a refusal to fulfill the need it's not just the calling of the dog but he he basically said hey like that this is reserved not for you this is reserved for the gentile uh, for the for the jewish people this is not reserved for you but yet she still found a way, right? She found a way to agree with what he had said um, and to recognize that there was still a way, that there was still hope. She didn't give up. There was still a hope that she had even after Jesus answered the way that he had. When when you think about the idea of receiving things under the table, it usually um, means getting it um, without others' involvement, without other people's intervention. Um, and the reality is this is what happened for this woman. Like nobody else needed to partner with this miracle, right? Um, she she had to partner with God by humbling herself. And she then um, um, petitioned him for what she needed, even though it looked like she wasn't going to get what she said, what she came for. Um, and I think that there's a tenacity, there's a perseverance that each of us needs to have to go beyond what we um, believe is about to happen and really trust God for what we do not yet see. Um, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we'll spend more time feeling like we have to create our own table rather than just going to his and I think a lot of people right now are like, we're in this space, we're like, oh, build, if they're not letting you at the table, build your own table. Um, but my question is, one, like, what's your motive behind that? Because I, I'm starting, look, hearing this now, I'm wondering how many of us are building tables based off of a fence. And tables based off of a fence cannot stand. Mm -hmm. At some point, they they fall, and what happens is, um, I think that some of us, Lord, I just have so many thoughts around this. I'm condensed. I'm a condense. So, um, I want to encourage people to at least get to the table and worry about the seat later, because even if mm -hmm. the seat never came, the food is still there. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> I, I love how he he said that the children were fed first. That does not say that the dogs were never fed. He actually intentionally said that they were fed first and still mentioned the dogs because the dogs still get fed. And I think if you are more focused on a seat than the meat, then you will you will always feel this pressure to create your own table and settle for some horrible meat, for some horrible meat that can't compare to his crumbs. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to condense this. I'm having such a hard time condensing this, but I'm just gonna end with this as far as the offense. And this is just something that I am learning. Other people's words and labels on you, towards you, you will take them on, own them real well, and say, I'm gonna prove you wrong from a space of offense. And then you go to the Lord yeah. with that offense that you actually have towards others and you put it towards him. So now your prayers are coming from a space of what they said about you. It's from a space of 
offense that you had towards other people and you're projecting it on Christ so that when he speaks to you and says, you're actually a son, you can't hear it. You can't receive it because I think like what you were talking about as far as how she owned the, the title of the dog. I think that we're having a hard and I don't want to go on a tangent and I know we can go on tangents with sons, but I think we're having a hard time receiving what the Lord is saying about us when he calls us sons, when he calls us daughters, when he calls us his children, because we're still so busy owning what others have said or so committed to proving that proving to them that we're wrong. And as long as you have that offense, it's very difficult to receive who you are in Christ. Um, I think that, I think I'm just like dealing with a lot over here. This is good. Um, but the, to go back to the whole dog thing, I, what I love about God, um, is he's not classist, right? Like there's no, like, I'm gonna do you, but I'm not gonna do, right? Like he proves in this story that if you want it bad enough, that's that's what separates people is intent is desire is pursuit right it's not what we think like titles and and how long you've been serving and what denomination you are right we put those those lines in place and think that that makes us whatever but the only thing that he is looking for is a pure heart right that is what um ranks you whatever right in the spirit um but the fact is that the dogs were still in the house to be under the table, you're still in the house. Um, and so you still have an owner, you still have a place. Um, and so like Pastor Adrian said, whether I'm sitting at the table, whether I'm washing the dishes, I'm still in the house, which means I am a part of the family. And if I am in the family of God, I have a right to the inheritance of God. And so I may not get it first, but I'm going to get it at, at the right time that is that is supposed to be mine. Um, and just the idea about um, a fence and, 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 you know, seats and, and building seats off of a fence. Um, one of the biggest things that a fence does is it blocks our ability to see God's hand past what we're feeling or past what was meant to hurt us, right? Because there are some things that really do like offend us and hurt us, right? Um, but if you are so focused on that pain and that feeling and that hurt, you will never see that God is saying, in spite of that, in spite of the weapon that formed, I didn't let it prosper. Um, and so while we are so focused on the attack and the intent and the hurt and the harm, we are missing everything that God is doing in spite of those things um, and how he is calling us higher and how he is calling us to forgive. Um, and the fact that he doesn't even hear us if we don't forgive. Um, so I think in all of this, while we are looking at what other people are doing to us, there is always a call for us to go higher. There was always a call for us to go deeper in him. Um, and if we focus on that, and if we remember that, um, then we won't feel the offense as deeply. And we won't feel it at all um, if we are we are focused, right? We'll feel it, right? But we won't let it control us. That's what I should say. Yeah. I want to point out that um, in all of this, this woman never asked for a full, a full meal, right? Like when she when she addresses Jesus, she has this yes, Lord moment, right? She's talking about the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She did not even ask for a complete meal, right? And and um, I think the revelation behind this is that crumbs are enough, that, that crumbs that fall from the master's table are more than enough when it comes to the bread of life, right? We have the opportunity to eat, right? From the bread of life, crumbs are more than enough, right? He is more than enough. John 6, 60, um, John 6, 55 through 56 says, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And many times we're asking for more than what we actually need, right? Like we are asking for all of these things, these superficial things, these surface level things, we're asking for more position and higher seats and to be closer, you know, and better seat at the table and a better view. And we're asking for all of this stuff when, as Elder Janae said, I just need to be in the room, right? Like, like just give me a seat in the house, like a place in the house. I don't even need a seat. Just give me a place in the house, right? Um, and whatever it is that is given to me is always going to be more 
more than enough because he is the all sufficient one. There is no in, there is nothing insufficient about him. He is our sufficiency. And so um, I want to um, tell you that every single blessing that we get from God, um, it is what we need in the moment, right? It is what we need. Um, it is more than enough, right? He is Jehovah Jireh, right? He's the God who provides and he provides more than enough. And so I want us to really begin to take a different look, a different perspective at what we have already been given, right? She hadn't even gotten the miracle yet, right? There's still a daughter who is sick as she is making this declaration. What Whatever he gives me is enough for this moment, right? Give us this day our daily bread. What he gives us is more than enough. Okay. Um, Lord, help me. I don't want to be that person. Okay. I'm going to be that person because you were talking and I was like, oh man, there are whole people coming into church, catching the crumbs, having, or just having these divine encounters with the Lord, catching the crumbs, running with it and advancing the kingdom. And then there's this other portion right. of the church that is obsessed with conferences, obsessed with writing another book, obsessed with having another worship session, obsessed with soaking for another four hours, obsessed with debriefing on the soak. And that person with the crumb ran and advanced the kingdom and you're still sitting talking to your buddies. You're still sitting waiting for that pastor online to give you um, revelation because you need more in order to do the next steps of things that God has called you to do. Like I, we're, if, we, if we are not careful, we will idolize revelation and never reach the point of living out his kingdom. Um, and I really just want to ask people, what are the crumbs that you have already eaten and done nothing with them? Cause you're waiting for dessert go out and advance the kingdom of God with the crumbs that he has given you. Your seat will still be there. I just have one little thing to say. <laughs> and I can't even say it. Um, this, <laughs> this woman was literally, this whole experience for her was crumbs. As she was speaking, she was living in it right? Like Jesus was speaking to her. This was like, she was literally getting the smallest parts of him, right? Like the fact that he wasn't speaking to her at first, right? Like this week wasn't even like a full shebang, right? We didn't even get to the miracle part yet, right? But with this little crummy interaction, she calls him Lord. Like she has a whole revelation Jesus. of who Jesus is. She goes from this posture of reverence to confession based off of this funny interaction, right? Like, it's like kind of weird. Like, you're not talking to me. You're making me bad. You're calling me a dog. She, this crummy conversation, she has a whole revelation about who he is. And like you said, Pastor Adrian, she could run with this. This is something she could literally take home and live off of. Um, and, and just knowing who he is, is enough. When you know who he is, that should be enough for you to run not another sermon, not another conference. I think I talk about conferences every week. I'm so glad I didn't say it first this week. Yes, <laughs> um, right? We don't, you know, we're like, we're asking God for more. And he's like, I already fed you. You are full. You are about to burst. You are literally bursting at the seams. Jesus. When you found out who I was, you had more than enough. Crumbs, you good off the crumbs. You're actually full. You don't need to eat anymore. Now just let somebody that. else come and eat. You Let's just Fat. Let somebody else come and eat because it's it's time for you to run now. It's time for you to go. You got to get on up now. Good night. I don't want to do it. Okay, let me go. All right, last verse. Let's do this so I can get off of this. Verse, verse um, and he said to her, For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter, and she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. I wanna read it again. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. It just broke. It just 
broke, right? This woman's profession, her confession is what set her daughter free. There was, there was no moment of touching. There was no waving of a staff. There was nothing that all she did was confess who he was. That's all she did was confess who she was. And based on her confession, her daughter was set free, right? Um, and I, I, what power lies in our confession, right? What power lies in what we are professing? And so for, for me, I always, I'm often um, thinking, I'm, also, I'm often considering the opposite of whatever one thing is, right? And so if there is a power in this profession of who he is, what other power do we have when we speak against who he is, right? If one is true, the other has also got to be true as well, right? The death and life are in the power of tongue. It doesn't just say life is in the power of tongue, of the tongue, right? And so we've got to be careful about our confession because I think that sometimes we're thinking that we're innocently saying some things that we end up living on, that we are just having a conversation, that it's not such a big deal, but that conversation is our testimony. That the moment that I linked up with Pastor Adrian and I began to speak about how awful things were and I didn't, they never going to change and this one is never going to measure up and this one is never, that was my testimony to her. I was testifying to her about what I believed God was able to do. And now I begin to live off of my confession, right? God, we live based on our confession. And so I want us to really get to the place where we are really cautious about what we say because we recognize that our words actually have power. That, that if, 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 if Jesus is the word, if he is the word and he lives in us, that there is a power in the words that we deliver. Our words create, uh, oh God, right? If, if you look at Genesis, right? If you look at the creation story in Genesis, everything that Jesus, everything that God did, he did it by word. He spoke a thing into existence. He created the world through speech. I believe that we're still creating worlds through our speech, that the world that we live in, the world that we abide in, the, wor the world that we, um, that we are um, um, receiving, that is a creation of what we have been speaking, right? Because um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's not just because of what you said, but it's because it's in your heart. It's the posture of your heart, right? And so every time that we're speaking defeat, every time that we're speaking doubt, it's not just our words. It's the posture of our heart. It is a faithless heart, right? And so as a result of it, we're living in accordance to what we have spoken. We could rush through this and celebrate the fact that this woman got what she wanted, but we cannot miss the fact that Jesus said, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter, right? The demon has left your daughter. Now, here's the thing. What I, what I really love about this um, is not just what Jesus um, confesses or what he pronounces over her, but what I love is that she trusted his word, that she didn't ask for proof. She didn't ask for details. He, 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 he said, this is what happened. And then she had an action that proved that she received what he said because she leaves from him and she goes back home expecting that something has changed in my environment. And I, I really wonder do we leave from our moments with God, whether that be through our individual prayer time, whether that be through our corporate gatherings, do we leave expecting something different when we get back to the place of the most need? Um, I believe that when you really have believed and received what God has spoken over you, you walk differently. You literally walk differently, right? Like I'm going back to the same situation with a new outlook expecting something to change because he said that it did. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. 
Um, in this season of uh, miracles, right, um, our apostle released the word about motion censored miracles. Um, and clearly by this story, we're also able to live in voice activated miracles, right? That by what we say, and this is not blab it and grab it. This no. is, I am aligning with the will of God, who God is, what he's already said. And I partner with that. And I agree in conversation with what he's already said. Um, and so my voice, what I believe that agreement is what releases the miracle to me. Um, and if you have, I'm, I'm not even going to say it because I have an, a device that if you say her name, she'll start talking back to you um, because it's always listening, right? Like it is waiting for me literally right now. It's kind of creepy, actually. It's waiting for me to call its name so that it can work for me. Um, and if we would take that same energy that we have for our devices and apply it to our faith and realize that Jesus is listening for us. And if we are saying things that align with his will, align with his word, align with his way, he is waiting to work based off of what we say because he said it first. We are living out on earth as it is in heaven. So we're not creating anything, we're not conjuring up anything, but he is his the the Bible says his eyes are looking to and fro, right? He is actively listening, waiting, and watching for those who will trust him and those who will believe him. And if we can change our language, if we can change our language with him, with ourselves, with one another, a lot of the things that we are actually complaining about will shift. The reason why, if we believe this, the reason why this is still like that is because I'm still speaking like that. The reason why the, the church is this way is because I'm still, I haven't prayed hard enough. The reason why my job is still the same way is because I haven't spoken the right thing, right? Um, if we believed in what we could confess that aligns with his word that much, we would see so much more movement and so much more miracles. And so maybe what we are looking for is on our tongue. Maybe the miracle that we are praying for is on our lips. And as soon as we re be really believe that we have that power, when we align with the Holy Spirit, we will see those miracles. Do you want to snack first? I got nothing. I'm good. Okay. Um, yeah, I. you definitely used a way cooler analogy to explain what I was going to cover. Um, but I really, really, we talked about like routines at the beginning of this. Um, and she was begging. She had a routine of begging um, before, but it didn't get a response. This specific moment, she said, yes, Lord, and then acknowledged who she was, who he was, and his ability to overcome the situation. Um, and if we can learn anything from her, I think, one, we can switch our begging um, around, not just the complaining, because some of us don't complain. We just beg. Um, if we switch out our begging for blessing him, um, how would that switch things? But not blessing out of routine because it sounds right. Not just doing it because it's religious, but doing it because you, you truly know that he is Lord. Um, and the other aspect to this is that it was because of this statement that he said, you may go your way, right? And there's this um, reality show that I absolutely love. I've talked about it before without saying the name, but there's a reality show that I absolutely love. Um, and it really comes down to, they have all these activities that they have to do. Um, and sometimes these activities have checkpoints and you cannot go to the next one until you finish the activity at the previous checkpoint. Um, and I kind of feel like for some of us, <laughs> we've been, it's, we, we're treating what we say to God like these moving puzzle pieces. We're trying to make the, we're trying to get the puzzle solved so we can go to the next thing. We're trying to say the right thing so that we can go to the next place. Um, and if you're so full, I don't, I don't want us to overthink 
just saying the truth about who he is. That's really all that this comes down to in order for you to move forward. But just like this is motion censored, just like it's um, voice activated, as, in a, as a result of that, you are actually able, God almost does the same thing back out at you. So you, you do something, your motion censored, and then he releases you as well so that you can actually move forward. Um, and I just want us to be able to realize that what we say actually releases us to our next destination. Um, and we're stuck right now because we're trying to concoct these things and come up with all these fancy terms when um, you're overcomplicating it and your next destination's waiting for you. Yeah, that's really good. I just want to point out before we close, I want to point out that um, this woman begged because she wasn't family. Um, but we're children um, and my children never have to beg for dinner. <laughs> they, they don't have to beg for their meal, but they ask. Um, and so I wanna just point out that a lot of us are still in the begging posture. And when you're begging God, it shows that you have not received sonship yet, that you have not um, received your position as a son or a daughter in the kingdom of God. And so I wanna encourage you to really begin to entreat God as father um, because this woman's situation was different. She was an outsider who was trying to get in, but you have already been brought in. And because I've been brought in, I ask my dad for a meal. I don't have to beg him anymore. And so um, I pray that you pray after this, that you go and you take this in, um, that you receive the fullness of what was um, spoken. I pray that you go back and that you rewatch it because I'm sure that there are some things that we all have missed, some new revelation that God um, will give to us individually um, specific to our lives. And so um, we love you guys and we're praying for you. Um, and I pray that you join us next week. Listen, next week is our last class on this topic. Um, so yeah, it's kind of bittersweet. I kind of, I really enjoyed um, this series. So close out with us, bring somebody with you next week um, so that we can um, just continue to learn about this miracle working God. Um, and yeah, we love you. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.